The rain hammered against my grimy office window, the neon glow of Neil Moscow bleeding through the grimy streaks. Another night, another potential client. This one, however, wasn't some two-bit thug chasing a runaway spouse. No, this one reeked of corporate intrigue and whispers of the black market. A data analyst, high-profile and supposedly squeaky clean, found dead in his apartment with his top-of-the-line memory implant scrubbed clean. They called it a suicide, but rich men with cutting-edge tech don't usually off themselves without leaving a trace. Someone wanted what was in that implant, and they were willing to pay a hefty sum for me to get it back. I glanced up from my desk as my partner, Dmitry Volkov, stalked in through the door. His massive frame was drenched from the downpour outside, but his augmented strength made it easy for him to maneuver through the rain without getting a hair out of place. He slammed a battered file folder down on my desk, the metal clanging against the wood. We're meeting with Dr. Kasilova in an hour, he growled, his voice gruff from the cold. She's the best in the business when it comes to neural implants, and she might be our ticket into this mess. I raised an eyebrow. And you're sure she's not too busy curing cancer or something? Dimitri snorted. I'm sure. She's been making waves in the underground scene, and she's always looking for a way to push the boundaries. Besides, she owes me a favor. I sighed, rubbing my cybernetic eye. Guess we're rolling the dice on that one, then. Standing, I brushed off my trench coat and straightened my fedora. Time to meet with the good doctor and see if she could help us crack this case wide open. We made our way through the rain-soaked streets, dodging puddles and pedestrians alike. The underground clinic we were directed to was hidden in plain sight, nestled between a shady sex-tape rental store and a hole-in-the-wall tavern. A discreet buzzer by the door confirmed our arrival, and a moment later, it swung open to reveal a petite woman with long raven hair and piercing green eyes. Dr. Evelyn Kasilova, I presumed. She ushered us inside, her office a stark contrast to the seedy exterior. Whitewashed walls, sterile steel furniture, and rows of gleaming surgical tools lining the shelves. Dimitri and I exchanged glances, wondering how someone like her could possibly thrive in this world. She motioned for us to take a seat across from her desk, her posture rigid and professional. So you're interested in my services? She asked, her voice cool and collected. I leaned forward, my elbows on my knees. We need your help with a delicate matter. I said, my tone as smooth as silk. A client of ours had a neural implant stolen from him, and we need to get it back. Dr. Kasilova raised an eyebrow, her expression unreadable. And why should I help you? She asked bluntly. I pulled out a thick wad of cash from my pocket and placed it on the table. Because this, I said, tapping the stack, is just a down payment. The rest will be paid in full once we get what we came for. She studied the money for a moment before nodding slowly. Very well, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. I can help you with that. But there are risks involved, and you must be prepared to face the consequences if you're caught. I grinned. That's why I brought along our muscle, Doc. I gestured towards Dimitri, who grinned back, showing off his sharp teeth. He's here to handle anything that might come up. She chuckled softly, her gaze flickering between us. Very well then, she said, leaning back in her chair. Let's get started. Dimitri and I exchanged a quick glance, both of us wondering what we'd just gotten ourselves into. But for now, it didn't matter. We had the best chance we were ever going to get, and we weren't about to let it slip through our fingers. Dr. Kasilova stood from her desk, her movements precise and graceful. Follow me, she said, leading us down a narrow hallway. The air grew colder as we descended, and the sound of whirring machinery filled my ears. This is my private lab, she explained, gesturing to the room around us. Here's where the real magic happens. The lab was a marvel of modern technology, with state-of-the-art equipment lining every inch of the walls. A large, glowing computer console dominated the center of the room, 
its holographic display showing intricate networks of code and data. The neural implant we were after could be anywhere in here, and we had to find it before someone else did. All right, here's the plan, Dr. Kasilova began, her voice low and urgent. Dimitri, you'll be in charge of searching. Look for anything that seems out of place or suspicious. Alex, you'll be with me at the console. We'll be searching through our records to try and locate the implant's signature. I nodded, feeling a surge of adrenaline course through my veins. This was it. The moment we'd been waiting for. Dimitri and I exchanged one final glance before splitting up, each of us getting to work. Dimitri arrived at the first location and started searching, while I manned the computer in the lab. The minutes turned into hours as we searched, our hearts pounding in our chests. Dimitri's growls of frustration echoed off the sterile walls as he struggled to find anything useful, while I poured over the holographic display at the console, desperately trying to find a trace of the stolen implant. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, a chime sounded from the console, catching my attention. I think I've got something, I said, leaning in closer. The display flickered to life, showing a grainy image of the neural implant we were looking for. It's there, Dimitri. I found it. He spun around, his yellow eyes wide with excitement. Where is it? He growled. I sent him a picture of a small metal locker in the corner of the room. In there. Dimitri raced over to the locker, his claws extended as he ripped it open. Inside, nestled among a few spare tools and pieces of equipment, lay the stolen neural implant. It was smaller than I expected, no larger than a thumb drive. But we both knew that it was worth a fortune on the black market. We'd done it. We'd recovered the implant, and we'd done it without getting caught. Now all that was left was to hand it over to our client and collect our payment. I trekked to Dimitri's location to wait for our benefactor. Well, our benefactor said, her voice softening as she approached us. That's quite a mess you've gotten yourselves into. But I suppose you've handled it rather well. She gestured to the locker. Shall we put that back where it belongs? With a nod, we began to carefully place the neural implant back into the locker, making sure it was secure. As we closed the lid, I glanced over at Dimitri. He was breathing heavily his chest rising and falling rapidly. He met my gaze and gave me a small smile. We might not be heroes, but we'd done the job we'd been hired to do. And for now, that was enough. Mrs. Kavka, our benefactor, stepped forward, her expression serious. All right, you too. Now that that's taken care of, we need to have a little talk. You both know the risks involved in this line of work. You've done well so far but we can't afford any more mistakes. Do you understand? I swallowed hard, feeling a mixture of pride and fear churning in my stomach. Yes, ma'am, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. We understand. Dimitri nodded in agreement, his features taking on a more determined look. We'll be more careful from now on, he growled. The doctor studied us for a moment before speaking again. Good. Now about your payment. She reached into her coat pocket and pulled out two small data cards. Here are your credits. They're untraceable and should be good for any port in the city. I took the data card from her, feeling a strange mixture of excitement and apprehension. We'd done it. We'd recovered the stolen implant and gotten paid. But at what cost? I couldn't help but wonder if this was really the life I wanted. Then again, it was too late now. We were in too deep. Thank you, Mrs. Kavka, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. For the opportunity. She nodded, her expression solemn. Just remember, you too. The next time you're in a fix like this, don't hesitate to call me. I may be the only one who can help you. Dimitri and I exchanged a final glance before turning to leave. The halls outside were deserted the lights dimmed. As we made our way back to our shuttle, I couldn't shake the feeling that we just made a deal with the devil. But for now, 
we had to focus on enjoying our newfound wealth and hoping that the next job wouldn't be quite as dangerous. As we climbed into the shuttle, I leaned back in my seat, closing my eyes. The familiar hum of the engines lulled me into a sense of false security. I knew that this line of work would always be dangerous, that there would always be people out there willing to pay for what we had to offer. But with each job, it became harder to forget the faces of those we'd left behind, the lives we'd destroyed in the process. Dimitri seemed lost in his own thoughts, staring out the window as the shuttle lifted off the ground. You know, Alex, he said finally, his voice quiet. Sometimes I wonder if this is really what we're meant to be doing. I opened my eyes, meeting his gaze. Yeah, me too. But it's too late now. We're in too deep. He nodded, turning away. Maybe we should just take some time off, find something else to do with our lives. You know, be normal for a change. I smiled sadly. And just what would we do with ourselves if we weren't running around playing heroes and villains? I asked, trying to make light of the situation. Maybe we should just find a quiet bar, order a drink, and forget about all this. As we flew through the darkened sky, heading back to our cramped apartment, I couldn't help but wonder if that was really possible. If we could ever truly escape the life we'd chosen, and find some semblance of normalcy amidst all the chaos. But for now, I would focus on the here and now, and try to forget about the questions that haunted me, the doubts that plagued my every step. Because if I didn't, I knew that I would lose myself entirely, and there would be no turning back. The apartment was dark and empty when we arrived, the only light coming from the dim glow of the terminal on my nightstand. I threw my jacket over the back of a chair and collapsed onto the bed, exhaustion washing over me in a wave. But even as I drifted off to sleep, I could feel the weight of our choices pressing down on my chest, making it difficult to breathe. I was jolted awake by the sound of my terminal beeping, signaling that I'd received a message. With a groan, I sat up and rubbed the sleep from my eyes, trying to make sense of the time. It was late, well past midnight. I glanced at the terminal, expecting it to be another job offer or a threat from someone we'd crossed in the past. But instead, it was a message from Mrs. Kavka. I hope you enjoyed your payment, it read. Just remember, the next time you need my help, I'll be waiting. But there's always a price to pay for such services. I shivered, feeling a chill run down my spine. She was right. There was always a price. And it seemed like we just paid it in full. Dimitri stirred beside me, mumbling something in his sleep before rolling over, his back to me. I stared at the ceiling, lost in thought as the weight of our choices continued to press down on my chest. It was a heavy burden, one that we'd been carrying for far too long. But what choice did we have? We were in too deep now, trapped in a world where the line between hero and villain was blurred beyond recognition. The next morning, I woke to the smell of bacon frying and the sound of laughter coming from the living room. I sat up, rubbing the sleep from my eyes, and glanced over at Dimitri. He was still asleep, his features relaxed and at peace for once. I couldn't help but feel a pang of guilt as I remembered the last time we'd had a real conversation, the last time we'd laughed together. It seemed like a lifetime ago. I got out of bed, pulling on a pair of sweatpants and a t-shirt before padding into the kitchen. The smell of breakfast was overwhelming, and I couldn't help but feel a little bit homesick. This was the first time in months that we'd had someone else cook for us. It was a luxury we couldn't afford, but somehow, our mysterious benefactor had seen fit to provide it. As I sat down at the table, a plate of steaming bacon and eggs in front of me, I couldn't help but wonder who was behind all this. The message the night before had left me feeling uneasy, and I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to our recent jobs than met the eye. I knew we needed to be careful to keep our guard up. But for now, I was going to enjoy this moment of normalcy, however fleeting it might be. Dimitri eventually joined me, his eyes still bleary with sleep. He took a seat across from me and dug into his food with gusto, not saying a word. 
The silence between us was heavy, like the air before a storm. I wanted to say something, to break the tension, but I didn't know what. We'd been avoiding these conversations for so long that I didn't know how to start them anymore. As we ate, I couldn't help but glance around the room, taking in the small details of our temporary home. The walls were adorned with tasteful art, the furniture was expensive and well-maintained. It was clear that whoever was footing the bill for our stay was someone with deep pockets. The thought made me uneasy, but I couldn't deny that the luxury was a welcome distraction from the grim reality of our lives. After breakfast, we retreated to our rooms to get some rest before our next job. Dimitri collapsed onto the bed, his face a mask of exhaustion. I lay down as well, staring up at the ceiling, my thoughts racing. I knew that eventually we'd have to confront the things we'd been avoiding, but for now, I was content to let the daydreams of normalcy wash over me, even if I knew they were just that dreams. As I drifted off to sleep, I couldn't help but wonder who it was that had helped us so generously. Was it a wealthy benefactor with a secret agenda? Or perhaps someone from our past, someone we'd wronged and now they were trying to make amends? The possibilities were endless and the more I thought about it, the more anxious I became. The next thing I knew, it was time to get up. My terminal beeped, signaling that we had a new job waiting for us. I sat up, rubbing the sleep from my eyes, and glanced over at Dimitri. His face was pale and drawn, his eyes haunted. I knew he was thinking the same thing I was. We couldn't keep running forever. Sooner or later, we'd have to face the music. But for now, we had a job to do, and we couldn't afford to think about anything else. We made our way to the living room, where our mysterious benefactor had left us a message. The address of our new target was burned into the screen of a laptop, along with the usual cryptic instructions. I glanced at Dimitri, who nodded grimly. We knew what we had to do. We suited up in our usual attire, dark, nondescript clothing that would help us blend in with the shadows. I pulled my hood up over my head, hiding my features from prying eyes. Dimitri did the same, and together we slipped out of the apartment, into the bustling city streets. The address led us to an old warehouse on the outskirts of town. The structure was massive, looming over us like a foreboding shadow. It was clear that this was going to be no ordinary job. We moved cautiously, our footsteps muffled by the layer of dust that coated the concrete floor. The air was thick with the smell of rust and rot, and the sound of our breathing echoed eerily off the bare walls. As we made our way deeper into the warehouse, we encountered a series of strange runes etched into the walls. They seemed to glow with an otherworldly light, casting strange, dancing shadows across the floor. I glanced at Dimitri who looked equally unsettled. We knew we were in over our heads, but there was no turning back now. We continued onward, our footsteps growing more cautious with each step. The air seemed to thicken, the atmosphere becoming more and more oppressive. I could feel the weight of it pressing down on my shoulders, making it difficult to breathe. Finally, we reached the center of the warehouse, where a massive circular dais had been erected. Atop the dais sat a glowing crystal orb, pulsing with an eerie light. Around it, a circle of candles flickered ominously in the darkness. We exchanged a worried glance, knowing that whatever we were supposed to do, it was going to be dangerous. Dimitri gestured for me to stay back while he inched forward, his movements slow and deliberate. He reached out a shaking hand and touched the crystal orb, causing it to hum softly. Suddenly, a blinding light filled the warehouse, and I was forced to shield my eyes with my arm. When I dared to look again, I saw that the orb had vanished, leaving behind a small, glowing key. It's done, Dimitri whispered, his voice hoarse. Let's get out of here. Together, we turned and began to make our way back toward the exit. But as we did, we heard a click, and the massive metal doors at the front of the warehouse slid shut trapping us inside. We exchanged a worried look, and then Dimitri nodded grimly. Looks like we're in for a little more trouble than we bargained for. 
he pulled out his cell phone, quickly dialing our mysterious benefactor. Hello? This is Dimitri. We've completed the first part of the job, but we're trapped inside the warehouse. We need you to open the doors. There was a brief pause, and then Dimitri sighed. Yes, I understand that it's risky, but we don't have much choice. Please, we're running out of time. I glanced around, searching for any other way out. The walls were lined with crates and stacks of rusting machinery, but they looked too unstable to climb or move. The ceiling was also high above us, out of reach. We were trapped, and our only hope lay with the person on the other end of the line. Dimitri hung up the phone and pocketed it. They said they'd see what they can do. In the meantime, we need to keep our eyes open. There might be another way out that we're missing. He began to methodically search the room again, running his hands over the crates and inspecting the corners for any sign of a hidden switch or lever. While Dimitri was busy searching, I found myself drawn to the circle of candles surrounding the dais. I walked over to it, cautiously stepping over the uneven concrete floor. As I drew closer, I noticed that the candles were not burning in the usual way. Instead of a steady flame, they flickered erratically, as if they were being blown by an invisible wind. Curious, I knelt down beside one of the candles and extended my hand. As I did so, the flame danced closer to my fingers, almost as if it were beckoning me. Summoning my courage, I reached out and gently blew it out. The darkness seemed to press in around me, and for a moment, I was disoriented. But then, I felt a click, and the doors at the front of the warehouse began to slide open, allowing a thin shaft of light to stream in. Standing up, I turned to Dimitri, who was watching me with a mixture of awe and relief. I think I figured something out, I said, my voice trembling slightly. When I blew out the candles, it reset the mechanism that was keeping the doors closed. Dimitri nodded, a grateful smile spreading across his face. That was incredibly brave, Alex. And clever, too. I'm proud of you. He glanced back at the dais, then back at me. Do you think it's safe to leave the key here? I considered the glowing orb in my hand, remembering the power it had held over the warehouse. I don't know, I admitted. Maybe we should take it with us, just in case we need it for something else. Together, we made our way out of the warehouse, careful not to disturb anything as we passed. The outside air was cool and fresh, and we both breathed a sigh of relief as we emerged into the night. Well, Dimitri said, wiping his brow, that was closer than I'd like. But we did it. Now, let's go find our contact and see what happens next. As we started to walk away, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more going on, something we hadn't quite figured out yet. But for now, we would have to wait and see what fate had in store for us next. Our contact had promised to help us, but with each step we took further away from the warehouse, I couldn't help but wonder if we had made the right choice. Dimitri seemed to sense my unease and squeezed my hand reassuringly. We did the best we could, Alex. We found the key, we escaped, and we're still alive. That's all we can ask for now. His voice was firm, but there was a hint of uncertainty beneath it. As we continued to walk through the abandoned streets, we caught glimpses of flickering lights in the distance. Our contact must be close by, waiting for us. My heart raced with anticipation and fear, equal parts eager to find out what would happen next and terrified of the potential consequences. Finally, we reached a small, dilapidated building where a figure stood waiting in the shadows. It was a woman, tall and imposing, her features hidden beneath the long, ragged cloak. As we approached, she stepped forward and whispered, You have what we need! Her voice was rough and hoarse, as if it had been weathered by time and hardship. Dimitri nodded solemnly, handing her the glowing orb. We found it in the warehouse but we don't know what it is or why it's so important. The woman studied the key for a moment, her eyes gleaming in the dim light. This, she said, her voice barely above a whisper, is the key to our salvation. With it, 
We can finally put an end to the curse that has plagued us for generations. Her words sent a shiver down my spine. She took another step closer, lowering her voice even further. But it is also a burden, one that must be handled with great care. You must understand the weight of your actions and the consequences that may follow. Dimitri and I exchanged glances, unsure of what to say. Finally, he spoke up, his voice steady despite his obvious fear. We'll do whatever we can to help. The woman's eyes narrowed, and for a moment, I thought she might refuse us. But then, she reached out and clasped Dimitri's hand in hers, her grip surprisingly firm. You have proven your courage and your loyalty, she said. You may join us. But know this, the road ahead will be long and perilous. There will be times when you will question your decision, and times when you will wish you had never set foot on this path. But you must not waver, for the fate of not only our people, but the entire world, hangs in the balance. Her words hung in the air, echoing through my mind like a warning bell. Dimitri squeezed my hand reassuringly, but I could feel the weight of her words pressing down upon us. This was no longer a game. This was reality, and the stakes were higher than either of us could have ever imagined. Come, the woman said at last, turning away from us. We have much to discuss, and little time to spare. She led us deeper into the building, through a series of cramped, dimly lit corridors. The air grew thick with the scent of age and dust, and the flickering shadows cast by the few torches they passed seemed to dance before our eyes, obscuring the truth even further. As we walked, I couldn't help but feel as though I were walking into the unknown, stepping into a world I barely understood. The weight of the woman's words hung heavily on my shoulders, and I could feel the tension in the air between Dimitri and me. We both knew that this was a decision we could never take back, and that the consequences of our actions would be felt for the rest of our lives. Finally, we emerged into a large, dimly lit chamber. Torches flickered on the walls, casting eerie shadows across the floor. The room was filled with people, some dressed in rags, others in what appeared to be finery from a bygone era. They all turned to look at us as we entered, their expressions a mix of curiosity and wariness. The woman who had given us the orb motioned for us to follow her to the center of the room. These are my people, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. They have suffered for generations under the curse. It is our duty to find a way to lift it, to restore balance to our world. Her words were both solemn and determined, and I found myself nodding along, even though I still had so many questions. As we stood there, lost in our own thoughts, the woman reached up and unwrapped the cloak from her shoulders, revealing a body scarred and marked by what appeared to be the curse itself. Her skin was pale and papery, her movements slow and labored. But there was a strength in her that I couldn't help but admire. I am the one who carries the curse she said, meeting my eyes. It is my burden to bear until the end. But I will not bear it alone. You both have chosen to stand beside me, and for that, I am eternally grateful. Her words struck me deep in the chest, and I felt a surge of emotion I couldn't quite name. Dimitri squeezed my hand reassuringly, and I knew that he felt it too. Together, we had stepped into something far bigger than we could have ever imagined and together we would see it through, no matter the cost. What will happen now? I asked the woman, my voice barely above a whisper. What is it that you expect us to do? She turned to face us, her eyes steady and determined. You must journey to the heart of the curse, she said. A place guarded by creatures both terrible and terrible strange. You must find the source of the curse and destroy it, once and for all. And how do we get there? Dimitri asked, his voice gruff with emotion. And how do we know what to do when we find it? The woman's expression grew somber. I will guide you as best I can, she said. But the path will be treacherous, and the dangers you will face are beyond reckoning. You must trust your instincts, and rely on each other. You must become stronger, faster, wiser. Only then will you have a chance of succeeding. 
As she spoke, I felt a strange tingling sensation begin to spread through my body. It started in my fingertips and worked its way up my arms, making my skin tingle and my muscles feel charged with energy. Dimitri seemed to sense it too, for he looked at me with a question in his eyes. What is it? he asked. I don't know, I said, feeling the sensation grow stronger. But it feels like I'm changing. The woman nodded knowingly. Yes, she said. The orb has bestowed upon you both its blessings. You are now bonded to it, and it will aid you on your journey. Use its power wisely, for it is a great responsibility. As the tingling sensation reached its peak, I felt a sudden rush of heat course through my veins. My vision grew hazy, and when it cleared I saw that the room had changed. The torches burned brighter, and the shadows danced along the walls like living things. And beside me, I saw that Dimitri had undergone a transformation as well. His eyes glowed with an inner light, and his muscles seemed to ripple beneath his skin. What's happening to us? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. The woman smiled, her eyes crinkling at the corners. You have become bonded to the orb, she said. It has granted you both the power to protect yourselves and those you love. Use this power wisely, for it is a great responsibility. Dimitri nodded slowly, his gaze fixed on the woman. What kind of power do we have? He asked, his voice low and steady. The woman gestured for us to follow her, and we did, leaving the small chamber behind. As we walked, the tingling sensation began to fade, but I could still feel the power coursing through my veins. You now have the power to control the elements, she explained. You can summon fire, water, air, and earth at your command. And with time, you will learn to master even greater powers. But what about me? I asked, feeling a bit left out. What can I do? The woman placed a hand on my shoulder, her touch warm and reassuring. You, my dear, have the power to heal, she said. You can mend injuries, soothe pain, and even restore life itself. Your gift is perhaps the most precious of all. And the curse? I asked, unable to keep the desperation from my voice. Can we undo it? The woman's expression grew solemn. The curse is deep and ancient, she said. It has been with us for generations. To undo it, you must journey to the heart of the darkness and face whatever evil lies waiting there. It will not be an easy task, but with your newfound powers and the bond between you, I have hope that you can succeed where others have failed. Her words hung in the air, heavy with meaning. I glanced at Dimitri, wondering if he was as terrified as I was by the thought of facing whatever lay ahead. He met my gaze, his eyes steady and determined. Then let's get started, he said. We've wasted enough time here. With that, we followed the woman out of the chamber and back into the main hall of the temple. She led us through a series of winding corridors and down a flight of stairs carved from the living rock. As we descended, the air grew colder and more oppressive, and the flickering torchlight cast strange, dancing shadows on the walls. This is where the darkness begins, the woman said, stopping in front of a massive iron door. Beyond this door lies the heart of the curse. You must pass through it together, and face whatever awaits you on the other side. She placed her hand on the ornate handle and pushed the door inward, revealing a dark, yawning chamber beyond. The three of us stepped inside, the door clanging shut behind us. As our eyes adjusted to the gloom, we saw that the room was filled with ancient statues and carvings, all depicting scenes of suffering and torment. A sense of foreboding settled heavily upon us. This is where you must find the key to undo the curse, the woman whispered. It lies hidden somewhere in this chamber. You must search together and trust each other implicitly. For the fate of not only yourselves, but of our world, rests in your hands. With that, she disappeared into the shadows, leaving us to face the darkness on our own. I felt Dimitri take my hand, and together we began to search the chamber, exploring every nook and cranny, our newfound powers guiding us. 
The air grew colder and more oppressive, the statues seeming to loom over us, watching our every move. As we wandered deeper into the chamber, I sensed a faint pulse emanating from a particular statue, carved in the shape of a goddess with her arms outstretched toward the sky. I guided Dimitri toward it, my instincts telling me that this was the key to undoing the curse. When we reached the statue, I felt a surge of energy course through me, as if the power of the goddess herself were flowing through my veins. It's here, I whispered, touching the statue's outstretched hand. The key to ending the curse. Dimitri nodded, his eyes shining with determination. Then let's take it, he said, and end this once and for all. With that, he placed his hand on the statue's other hand, and I felt a rush of power surge through us both. The chamber grew brighter, the statues seeming to glow with a faint, unearthly light. As the power coursed through our bodies, we were able to harness it, using it to banish the darkness and heal the ancient wounds that had plagued our world for generations. With each passing moment, the chamber grew brighter, and the air grew warmer. The ancient curse was broken, and the world was finally set free. When the last vestiges of the darkness had faded, we turned to face each other our hands still clasped tightly together. We had done it. We had saved the world. But at what cost? The weight of the curse, the burden of our powers, the knowledge of what we had been through and what we had done, it all threatened to crush us beneath its weight. The silence after the world's liberation was heavy, thicker than the oppression we just lifted. Dimitri's hand, clasped in mine, felt cold and detached a stark contrast to the warmth that had filled the chamber moments before. We did it. He finally spoke, his voice raspy. But it wasn't a triumphant declaration. It was a hollow echo, a question hanging in the air. At what cost? I mirrored his question, the words tasting like ash in my mouth. The chamber, no longer pulsating with ethereal light, seemed to mock us with its newfound emptiness. The weight of the world— once a burden shouldered by millions, now pressed down on us alone. We were vessels, momentarily filled to the brim with power, now left drained and questioning. A low hum resonated from the hand we held clasped. A faint glow pulsed beneath our skin, a constant reminder of the power we now possessed. With a surge of nausea, I realized it wasn't just power, it was a piece of the curse itself, forever woven into our being. Dimitri released my hand, his eyes filled with a newfound wariness. We were heroes, yes, but forever tainted. The world might be free, but were we? The weight on my shoulders shifted. Saving the world wasn't the end. It was the beginning. The beginning of a new life, forever bound to this power, forever vigilant against the darkness it might unleash within ourselves. A single tear escaped Dimitri's eye carving a glistening path through the dust on his cheek. He wasn't just crying for the burden, but for the innocence we'd lost. In that moment, a silent pact formed between us. We'd saved the world, but now, we had to save ourselves from the shadows we now harbored within. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please subscribe to stay updated with our latest stories, give us a like if you want to see more, and drop a comment below to let us know your thoughts.